Hello and welcome to Threaded Together, a podcast that stitches together home sewing and high fashion. We're your hosts. I'm Tracy. I'm Rebecca. This is our seventh episode for Threaded Together and we are so excited to have you. And we're really thrilled to have you back listening to us again. Instead of directly introducing today's episode, I'd like to give you an analogy that will help us understand what we're talking about and why it's relevant, even if you've never heard of any of the terms we'll be discussing, like jets or welts before. Is that all right with you, Tracy? Absolutely. I'm on board. Go ahead. (laughs) Well, I was watching the second season of The Bear, which is a TV show about high concept cooking. And in one of the scenes in a Michelin star or a very fancy restaurant, the head chef was hand peeling a mushroom and was asked why they were doing that. She answered that the mushroom was a way to show the guests the amount of care and hand labor that went into making the meal. The mushroom was a symbol of the craftsmanship and effort in the meal. Today, we're talking about some of the most feared construction techniques that also just happen to be the things that reveal how well a garment is made and show that extra care was taken in the construction. Our version of hand-peeled mushrooms for the fashion world are jets, welts, bound buttons, pockets, collars. And today we'll be sharing what makes these details so special, how they can be a hack to identify highly crafted garments, and of course, some tips on how you can make these challenging garment details easier to perfect if you're adding them to your own clothing. I love this comparison. It's so true. And I also loved watching The Bear. It's such an incredible show. And I hope that that helps you get as excited as we are for this very, very fabulous episode. So we're really excited to dive into our main topic today. But before we get into that, What have you been working on in the last month? In our last episode, we discussed the Barbie movie and I said I wanted to make an outfit and in a shocking turn of events, I actually did make a jacket. I drafted my own pattern from a couture pattern book and I used quite a few tailoring methods to make it. I had so much fun making that jacket that I also started tackling a jacket idea inspired by the Dior bar jacket with a matching pair of tailored shorts. Trying to create something on the level of a Dior bar jacket requires a lot of learning and practice. And I'm really enjoying being in that position of actually trying out these couture techniques and seeing the time spent really, really pay off. How about you, Tracy? What have you been up to? Well, I really loved seeing the progress of your Barbie jacket and oh, thank you. the finished result is spectacular and you will have to share the video you made of it with our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had a, I've had quite a productive month of sewing. I know I said I wouldn't make anything for the Barbie movie, but after we spoke, <laughs> I had a moment of inspiration and I changed <laughs> my mind. Um, so I made a pink boiler suit, so the closet core Blanca flight suit. A couple of years ago, I made one in blue denim, and after that, I'd prepped it to sew in a pink cotton twill. I like to collect everything that I want for a project, um, all the notions and threads and so on, in a A3 Ziploc bag. And so this is something I'd prepped a while ago, like it was all cut out and ready to sew. So it was actually quite achievable to turn around before seeing the movie. Um, and yeah. You're so the organized, Tracy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, only in some areas. <laughs> but I, I love the concept of dressing up to see a movie. It's so much fun. I love the boiler suit that you made. I'm a huge fan of jumpsuits. And it was so perfect for the inspiration. I never would have guessed that you had just prepped that ahead of time and it wasn't exactly copied for that movie and it fit you so well thank you i also completed a couple of other speedy sews made a couple of skirts one of which i absolutely lived on um on holiday recently i also love the green skirt that you just shared with me but we'll see if we can get you to share that on (laughs) social media and tracy you also did some traveling this past month as well any highlights any fun fashion moments to share um a few trips abroad i went to amsterdam and ireland but i don't think there was any fashion highlights from those i'm afraid um well apart from my beautiful handmade wardrobe obviously um (laughs) always a highlight (laughs) but i also visited the diva exhibition at the vna which is a 
truly wonderful exhibition and I highly recommend it. It steps mm-hmm. through divas over time, spanning the 19th century to now, starting with some of the early prima donnas, opera singers and Victorian theatre stars and dancers and silent movie stars and female stars of Hollywood's golden age through to contemporary pop divas. Oh, and um, the exhibition is accompanied by an incredible playlist that changes as you move through the exhibition. Um, and the dresses on show are beautiful. And um, some of my favourites from the exhibition included a dress that Carol Lombard wore in the 1934 film We're Not Dressing, and there was a dress that Kate Blanchett wore um, as Catherine Hepburn in The Aviator, which was absolutely stunning as well. Those sound so fabulous. Uh, When is the exhibit going to, in case I happen to pop over to London on one of these weekends? (laughs) It's on until April next year and Mm. April 24th. So it's definitely achievable to visit. Oh, okay. Lots of time. Um, I'm also really looking forward to the Chanel exhibition at the Viennale, which is on from the middle of September. Oh, we may need to plan something for that. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) But speaking of travel, you went to the Copenhagen Fashion Week as well, didn't you, last month? Yes. uh, Just a short week or two ago, time is flying. I had the pleasure of attending Copenhagen Fashion Week. One of the things that I love about Copenhagen Fashion Week is you're just as likely to see people dressed in like head to toe vintage clothing as you are in head to toe designer at shows, which I think is really exciting. There is also sustainability requirements for participating brands, which makes it an exciting place to be. But I'll share some more stories from that a little bit later in this episode. So before we jump in, if you're enjoying the podcast, we would love for you to give us a thumbs up or five stars or like this episode or even share it with a friend. Your support means the world to us. And of course, for more behind the scenes content, you can always find us on all social channels at Threaded Together Podcast and our website, threadedtogetherpodcast.com. On to today's topic. As we approach autumn and start thinking about our autumn projects and things we may want to add to our wardrobe, we wanted to talk about key garment features that are present on so many things in our wardrobe, especially during this season. A lot of these details are really beautiful and elevate your garments and especially your makes, but they also come with their challenges, which is why they are often considered the most feared construction techniques. Today, we're going to be discussing pockets, welts or jets, collars and buttonholes. We will be sharing what each of these garments features are and what types of clothing they appear on. We'll also be discussing the complexity of each feature and how likely you are to see them in manufactured garments. And of course, we will share tips on how to be as successful as possible using each of these construction features in your makes. Let's start with pockets. We all know what a pocket is, but there are so many different kinds of pockets. The Vogue sewing book quite rightly says that pockets are important. They can beautifully accent a professional scene or they can blatantly expose a poor construction job. (laughs) Oh, that is so well put, Tracy. They can be tricky from a construction aspect, but we all love and need good pockets. And in my opinion, as many as possible in your garments. It's so interesting because from a practicality point of view, you want as many pockets as possible. But from the visual form of a garment, pockets aren't always ideal. Um, I follow Thrifty Stitcher on Instagram and she does mm. lots of adjustments for TV presenters. Um, and because of the gaping and opening of the mouth of a pocket it can be a bit distracting for on TV. And so she'll often Mm. share stories of her closing or removing pockets. Oh, that's so fascinating. I've also heard a lot of removing pockets from white trousers as well. Oh, because you can see the shadow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, Interesting. So maybe we don't want pockets. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we don't. (laughs) But in case we do. (laughs) Well, pockets can be overwhelming. Um, I mean, honestly, we could do an entire episode (laughs) on pockets. Indeed, we absolutely could. So today we'll just focus on the main types of pockets and how they attach to the garment. Some of the most popular types of pockets are seam pockets, a pocket where the opening falls along the seam of a garment, sometimes known as a secret pocket because you can't see it from the outside. You can have seam pockets that are all in one piece with the main fabric. So for example, the valley dress by Pattern Fantastique has this type of 
pocket. So just to clarify, this means that the pocket is connected to one side of the fabric, Tracy, correct? And your hands still go on the side? Yeah, that's right. So I guess if you were to draw the side seam of the skirt pattern, you'd draw a P <laughs> for the right hand side so you can see the, the pocket jutting out of the, the skirt itself. Ah, that makes that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. I have a, a 1970s YSL skirt where the pleat in the side seam forms the pocket and it's absolutely genius. Oh, wow. That is something we definitely want to see pictures of. Another type of pocket is the separate inseam pocket where the pocket pieces are separate to the main piece and sewn on. I think this is what we see most commonly in sewing patterns. For example, Tracy will link this reference, the Vogue pattern V9075. It's, like, to be honest, it's most of the Vogue patterns. That was just the first one that popped into my head. The reason for separate inseam pockets pockets is they allow the pocket fabric to be different from the external fabric of the garment. This may not make as much of a difference on a lighter weight fabric, but think about a heavy tweed coat. It might be a little bit uncomfortable if the pocket was a heavy tweed as well. Then you have extension in seam pocket. And this is where there's an extension on the main piece and a separate seam pocket is attached to that. So if you were looking at your skirt pattern piece, for example, it would have a little rectangle, um, for example, jutting out of the side. And then you'd have a separate pocket piece that attaches to that. I know I've sewn up one of these recently, but I can't, <laughs> I can't picture what one it is. <laughs> I actually do have an example of that recently. I can look up the exact pattern number, but it was a vintage jumpsuit. And what I really love about the extension inseam pocket is the beginning of the pocket bag is cut into that self fabric. So it gives the illusion that the entire thing is the same piece without it actually having to be all in one piece. Yes. Which is especially helpful if you're working with a weightier fabric. You can use a pocketing fabric for the actual fabric uh, for the pocket. But if you get a glimpse of the inside of the pocket, you can't tell. You can do some really fancy inseam pockets. Um, so you could do something where the side zip on a dress, for example, also has a pocket. Reds Magazine has a really great tutorial for this, which we'll link in the show notes. You'll also see seam pockets on the side of dresses and skirts and on the outer seam of some loose fitting trousers and culottes. Seam pockets are one of the easiest hacks that you can make to a garment, be it a pattern that you're making up or something that you already own. You also have front hip pockets. You'll see those as inserts on jeans and boiler suits and dungarees and, and certain trousers. And this is where you have your pocket piece often folded and a facing piece. These are actually one of my favorite styles of pockets. They can be made as inseam or extension pockets, but the key feature is that the opening of the pocket or the pocket mouth is visible and made of the same fabric as the main garment. On trouser patterns, these can be called a slash pocket, or in my favorite trouser book, Making Trousers for Men and Women by David Page Coffin, they call them slant pockets. This pocket style covers everything from traditional denim front pockets to trouser pockets with the opening of the pocket mouth being set away from the side of the garment. And in the case of a trouser, it connects to the waistband. The secret to a good Good front hip or slant front pocket is under stitching the top piece at the mouth of the pocket opening. Under stitching just means that you stitch the inside of the fabric to the seam allowance in a very kind of invisible way, thus creating a reinforcement that you can't see on the pocket that ensures your pocket lays flat and sometimes points in the right direction. A good resource for this that we'll have in the show notes is from thelaststitch.com where they have a great sewing tutorial for a face trouser pocket and they show you exactly how to do this under stitching in a really easy way. Another type of pocket is patch pockets. So a pocket on the outside of a garment, you see this more often on workwear style garments where you can see the full outline of the pocket on top of your garment. For example, a jacket with a patch pocket. Friday Pattern Company is a, a really um, good example of this on, in their Ilford jacket. They also mm. have um, a great description of a variety of different patch pockets and some free downloads of different types of patch pockets. And we'll link their instructions um, 
in the show notes. You can also find patch pockets on the back of jeans, of which, side note, Closet Core has a great download of back pocket designs, which again, we'll link in the show notes. Patch pockets can also apply to the kangaroo pockets that you often see on hoodies or coin pockets that you see on jeans. Almost all cargo pockets, also known as utility pockets or bellows pockets, or even accordion pockets that you see on hunting jackets, military wear, cargo pants. These are also examples of patch pockets. This is because the patch pocket increases storage space outside of the garment itself, hence the need for them to be attached on top or patched on to your garment. And breast or chest pockets are often ordinarily patch pockets. And in order to apply a patch pocket to a garment, you have to top stitch the pocket bag to the garment, which gives you an opportunity to make them really fancy by adding details like pin tucks or lace or trim. Set in pockets or inset pockets or bag pockets are made by cutting an opening anywhere in the garment and stitching the pocket bag to the inside of the garment or placing a pocket into the main body of the garment. But these are mainly welts or jets, which is exactly what we are going to talk about next. But first, let's just talk about some tips about making pockets easier. So for inseam pockets, make sure <laughs> you press them forward. I say <laughs> I say this because one of the first items of clothing I made was some pajama bottoms for my now husband. And um, the passion didn't have any pockets, but I added them in badly, I may add. And to this day, he still complains about having to put his hand into the pockets backwards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I, I say that. that the fact that they've lasted this long is a testament to my sewing skill. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And this sounds exactly like something I would do. I'm sure I have at some point. <laughs> so another tip is think about the location of the pockets. So for example, in seam pockets, depending on your height compared to how the pattern's drafted, you may need to adjust where they sit. You want pockets that are below your waist to sit at a level where you can place your hands into them easily and naturally. Mm -hmm. And to that point, if you have adjusted your pattern along the lengthen or shorten line, if that aligns with a pocket placement, adjust the pocket length too. Um, and that won't always be marked up on a pattern. Oh, that is such a good point because I mm -hmm. have done that on patterns where I have shortened usually <laughs> based on my height. But that's that's a great point that the pocket doesn't move, but you should move it. Some pockets are decorative rather than practical. And so you need to think about their placement to make sure that you're happy with their location. So for example, you don't want to breast pocket to sit above the breast. Also, when you add a pocket to a garment can vary based on the type of garment. So when you actually sew it onto the garment. Mm -hmm. For patch pockets, an easy rule is to add them on your pattern piece before you sew it up so you can get as many flat surfaces to work with as possible. Absolutely. But you really need to make sure that the placement is right. Totally. So for patch pockets where there is a pair, there are a few tricks to getting them even. One is to base them together, right sides together, then turn them right side out and press, and then remove your basting stitches. And this gives you a pair of absolutely symmetrical pockets ready to place onto your garment. I um, love that. Another method is to use cardboard, cut to the pocket shape without any seam allowances, and then using that card template, press your fabric seam allowances around the edge. Oh, I'm always learning something new. I love both of these tips, Tracy. Now, I had mentioned earlier the YSL skirt that I had, mm -hmm. and I just went and took a look at it to see what class the pockets that were on that skirt fell into. So I remember there was a TikTok trend a little while ago where there was a bunch of hubbub about these specific pockets mm -hmm. that are virtually invisible and appeared in garments between the 1970s and the 1990s, if I'm remembering correctly. And the skirt we're discussing today is a piece from 1976, the Opera Ballet Russe collection. How I got it in mint condition is a story for another day. So on the left side of the skirt, the pocket mm -hmm. is hidden beneath a box pleat. And on the right side of the skirt, half of the pocket is part of the side seam. And then the other part is hidden under the side flap in a pleat in the front of the skirt. Oh, wow. And having looked at the photos that you shared, I would say that they are fully in seam hidden pockets. But if you look closely, there's a tiny seam slightly inside the pocket to attach 
a separate piece. <laughs> so maybe on closer inspection, they're actually an extension in seam pocket. I don't know. They're really fascinating. Absolutely. As we were chatting about earlier, Tracy, the pockets are gorgeous on that skirt and they blend in so beautifully into the garment. You wouldn't even know that they were there, but what a challenging thing to construct. No wonder you don't see such complex pockets very often unless the garment is really expertly constructed. Yeah, absolutely. It takes real craftsmanship for that level of a hidden pocket. Um, It makes you want to start peering into the pockets of all the other garments and seeing how complex they are, doesn't it? (laughs) It really does. And what a great way to tell if something is beautifully made. And what a really fun way to add a special detail to a standard sewing pattern. Absolutely. So how about diving into jets and welts next, Tracy? Yes. Okay. So confession, I honestly thought it was a US versus UK English terminology thing and that they were the same. But on researching, it seems that's maybe not the case. Hmm, I would have said the same thing. I've been using Claire Schaefer's Couture Tailoring Book a lot lately, and it says when referring to a double welt opening, quote, in men's tailoring, they're called jetted. In couture, they're called piped, but both are referencing to the bit of fabric that appears in the opening to the pocket that you often see on blazers or on the back of trouser pockets. So jets or welts on a garment are the use of a separate piece of fabric that is visible at the opening of the pocket and creates a pleasing detail to the eye while also reinforcing the opening. They allow you to put the pocket mouth or pocket opening anywhere on the garment without accessing a seam line. Welts come in different varieties, the most common being single or double welted, which means you have an extra bit of fabric on one side of the pocket opening or both. Welts are often used on the back pockets of trousers and on the front of tailored jackets and coats. If the garments that you see them on are any indication, they are a more complex detail to add to a garment. What makes welts and jets challenging is the need to attach a separate piece of fabric in a way that makes the attachment invisible from the outside of the garment. The welt fabric is sewn to the outside of the garment then a cut is made through both pieces of fabric and the outside of the fabric is then pulled inside and folded upwards or downwards to make a small clean fold at the opening of the pocket. And in order to achieve um, uh, the impact of a a clean welt, tiny snips are done at the corners of the pocket opening, and then they are reinforced invisibly using the extra welt fabric and the pocket bag. It's a tricky thing to accomplish, Tracy. And I think my heart sinks every time I do that big cut for the welt because you cut through your fabric. And then there's no going back after that. (laughs) My first welt that I ever did was in our couture tailoring class. And since then, I do use them often, but still with much frustration every time. How about you, Tracy? (laughs) I had sewn a few before the class and a few since. Um, I think most recently on a bomber jacket or Mm. or a coat or something. But I certainly have not sewn enough of them to be able to sew (laughs) without instructions and without really taking them very slowly. Oh, absolutely. Same here. And the sides of a welt are really what can get you. Those almost invisible triangles of fabric you hide in the inside of the welt. And if you don't cut through the corners perfectly, your welt will pucker or pull, which is why having a welt on a garment is an easy way to tell that it's very well made. There simply isn't enough function to justify adding a welt. Instead, it's done purely for aesthetics and a beautifully welted pocket usually means a beautifully crafted garment. A quick story uh, here, Tracy. At Fashion Week, I was looking at a small collection that was being shown on mannequins and it was Uh, beautifully made. It was handmade by a very seasoned designer, but in nylon, and they had chosen to welt every pocket. Mm -hmm. Again, welting a pocket involves what we like to call some origami like fabric folding with right size sewn together. And if the hidden corner that you don't see in the welt isn't cut just perfectly, it will pull and you'll see that from the outside of the garment. Nylon, unfortunately, is not a forgiving fabric. At least this nylon had no stretch. And there was a red jacket on display that was a single welted pocket that was absolutely gorgeous. And the welt was probably about a centimeter wide. So it was pretty chunky, but as beautifully made as the garment very obviously was, Mm -hmm. the corner of the welts were pulling. 
And again, very likely just because the absolute lack of of any kind of stretch or given the fabric choice, but also a good reminder that even very seasoned designers and makers can still produce a not completely perfect welt pocket. Well, that makes me feel a lot better about my welts. (laughs) (laughs) What terrifies me most about making a welt pocket is that they often come in pairs and while one might be close to perfect, getting (laughs) too close to perfect feels like a game of chance. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I I can relate to that. I love that. It's so true. I feel like if the first welt goes badly, that's almost a good sign because then the (laughs) second one will be good, but then they aren't even. And then if the first one goes well, I get really nervous because then I am expecting to botch the second. (laughs) (laughs) There are a lot of really great resources for doing a welt pocket. Most couture garment books or even the trouser making book I referenced earlier that again will be in the show notes have really good slow walkthroughs to help you execute them as best as possible. So on to tips, what tips have we got for a good welt? One of the best tips for a welt of any kind is to make sure you interface the welt itself. That can be through horsehair if you're making a couture tailor jacket or even a fusible interfacing will make the welt creation so much easier. Not only does the interfacing support the folded welt, which can sometimes be only millimeters wide, it also supports that teeny hidden corner that gets tucked away inside and makes it more likely that you'll have a clean finish on your final project. Another tip is to base the welt before and after you make it. So once you chalk the center of the desired opening, you can base the full length of the welt end to end on either side of the opening, but do not baste across the ends of the welt. And then once you stitch along your basted lines and cut open the welt, you press that seam line before folding the fabric inside. Ooh, Tracy, I was also reading that adding glue to the little triangles inside the welt was a tailor's tip. And I thought that was quite funny, like Elmer's glue. I had not come across that at all, (laughs) (laughs) but definitely something to try, I guess, after testing the glue on on the fabric. (laughs) Since welts can stretch out easily, it's customary once they are finished to base them close until the garment is used. We love to hate them, but like so many other things, welts take a lot of practice. So the more we do them, the better we get. So next on our list is collars. They come in so many different shapes and forms and you see them on shirts, jackets, coats, and some dresses as well. You can have piece collars, tailored collars, convertible collars, so many types of collars. The collar concept is fairly self-explanatory. It's whatever goes around your neck on a garment. The nature of the place of attachment and the need to either fold a certain way or stand while going around the significant curve of your neck makes the collar one of the most complex parts of a jacket or shirt. Some notable collar types are flat collars, like the Peter Pan collar, which could be either low and round or high and round, and they emerge from the neck seam line to sit flat against the garment, raising only slightly above the neckline. These are more commonly seen on shirts or dresses and are made in lighter weight fabrics. And others are rolled collars like the notched collar and the shawl collar, which stand up from the neck edge and then fall down to rest on the garment. Due to the draped nature of this collar type, it's common style for knitwear and blouses and evening wear and some coats as well. And then in more of the traditional jacket coat and shirt categories, you have standing collars, collars that are reinforced and have an actual collar stand or a piece that allows the collar to extend upwards from the neckline, defying gravity, if you will. (laughs) Examples of these are mandarin collars, funnel collars, low or high bias collars as well. And thinking of some of the collars I've made in some of my recent makes, they include a pussy bayou collar, a collared v-neck, a traditional shirt collar, two-piece standing collar, a mandarin collar. (laughs) I, I love a statement collar. I really do. I love a high bias roll on a shirt. It kind of looks like a turtleneck if you use the American terms. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is that? A roll neck? Is that what you call it? I think so. Um, <laughs> but it's it's straight up and cut on a bias. And I also love a giant convertible collar on pretty much anything. This allows you a lovely statement that always lays flat on top of your shoulders, creating a broader neck opening, but then you can flip it upwards to create a cozy cocoon that covers your face and neck. There are so many collar types and they are ever changing with fashion trends. 
Oh, yes. Collar shapes are very trendy, perhaps because of the very specific origins of so many different types of collars. They carry with them a very strong aesthetic connotation. So when you see, for example, more romantic clothing popularized, you might see more pussy bow collars or big lace ruffled collars. Mm -hmm. A great example of a collar shape driving a trend was actually during COVID. Baby doll dress had a huge moment and with it came a big influx of Peter Pan collars. Collars, the similarly playful, curved, big, flat collars that also give an almost childlike fun to an outfit. Interestingly, Peter Pan collars got their name by being designed in 1905 for an actress named Maude Adams, who's playing the role of Peter Pan, and the almost circular shaped collar became popular in children's wear and school uniforms following that. Wow. And during COVID, when dopamine dressing or dressing for one's own personal enjoyment was at its height, adding a circular statement Peter Pan collar fueled that playful, fun aesthetic that was such a major trend of the moment. That's so interesting. Okay, so making a collar lie appropriately around your neck in whatever shape you desire can be challenging and requires a bit of extra skill and care to do it well. Should we talk through some of our top tips? So the underside or under collar should never show, nor should the seams at the finished edge. When comparing pattern pieces, when you're sewing together a collar, you'll often find that the under collar is a smidge maybe a quarter of a millimeter smaller than the top collar to aid in it not showing. You'll also find this point reiterated in pattern instructions. And when pressing it, you ensure the seams are always rolled so that you cannot see the under collar. And then always stitch the collar sections together with the collar grain. So starting at the center and then towards the end. Also, make sure you trim and grade a collar to reduce bulk. This is particularly important since at the seam line of your collar, you actually have the most layers of fabric coming together at any point in your pattern. So make sure you trim the seam allowance on the under collar so that you don't get a ridge or impression showing on the right side of the collar. Yeah, and then trim corners as close to the diagonal as possible on the points of the collar. A tip you often see on stitching corners on collars is to not sew them at complete right angles, but sew two or three small diagonal stitches or stitch a diagonal stitch on top of your sewn corner. I also uh, personally do sew them at right angles, but then I do a diagonal cut as close to that corner as possible. Yeah, which is a good, a good way to do it. If it's a curved collar, make sure you notch or clip. So clipping um, inwards, the concave curves and notch outward, convex curves. And you also want to make sure the front of your collars at the center front openings are symmetrical, which is something I have done incorrectly before. Basically makes you look a little lopsided. So don't do that. <laughs> Depending on the weight of your fabric, follow the interfacing guidelines of the pattern. But if it's a very soft or sheer fabric, or if it's a very soft style of collar, it may not require interfacing. And make sure that the weight of the interfacing is compatible with the weight of the fabric that you're working with as well. Might be a great use for silk organza, Tracy. <laughs> Absolutely, always. <laughs> so let's talk buttonholes. Buttonholes come in different varieties. You have thread or stitch buttonholes where the buttonhole edge is bound in thread. These are often used in tailoring, jackets, and most manufacturing clothing because they can be done very easily by machine. Mm -hmm. Bound buttons or fabric buttonholes have a teeny bit of fabric showing on either side of the buttonhole. Teeny tiny welts, if you will, <laughs> that create <laughs> a beautiful finish on a garment and are almost always done by hand. Bound buttonholes are done often by dressmakers on women's garments. And then lastly, we have an inseam buttonhole, which takes advantage of an opening created by a seam line to house a button. So we're going to discuss bound buttonholes today since they are considered a more couture technique for creating buttonholes. But it also does come down to your fabric choice to determine what is the most practical for a garment. Bound buttonholes have a particular sentimental value to me, Tracy, because I remember my mother showing me a bound buttonhole on a jacket she had made in college and telling me that that was the 
ultimate hallmark of a really beautifully created garment. The irony though, was I went through life looking for garments with bound buttonholes as this bar to be achieved. But honestly, they aren't often used anymore, Mm -hmm. probably because they're made using the exact same technique as welted pockets, which we just explained is very complex, but with only a few mere millimeters of fabric used as your welt. And you also usually have to do it multiple times in a row, sometimes five and six identical buttonholes. Mm -hmm. And they have to be just as beautiful from the inside of the garment as they are from the outside. (laughs) You make them sound so pleasant. (laughs) (laughs) You see bound buttonholes so much more often on vintage garments. Yeah. And if you do see them on a garment, then it is a great way to know that a lot of effort went into the construction of that article of clothing. However, I did learn the hard way that high pile fabric such as velvet or terry cloth is virtually impossible to use to make a clean bound buttonhole. So stick with a threaded buttonhole on those. That's unfortunate to learn that the hard way. (laughs) Rebecca, you've got a lot more experience with bound buttonholes than me. Have you got any tips for executing a perfectly sewn bound buttonhole? Well, I'll let you know if I ever do execute (laughs) a beautifully (laughs) bound buttonhole. But executing a bound buttonhole is pretty much the same as a double welted pocket for the front of whatever garment that you're adding it on to. Except that once the welt is done, you then have to add the facing or your lining fabric. And the way you do that is you base it in place. And then you cut just the smallest sliver of a buttonhole opening very precisely through that fabric Mm -hmm. and then finish it using betweens needles, those really tiny ones we've talked about before. And just hand stitching, catching just a sliver of the fabric and tucking it underneath the welt. It's an incredibly complicated thing to do. And to reference that uh, we talked about, I looked up in Claire Schaefer's book on three different ways to execute the inside of a bound buttonhole. And they're all the same. It's Mm -hmm. cut a very precise slit and then by hand just stitch that edge into the buttonhole. Honestly, Tracy, if I hadn't had this idea stuck in my head that bound buttonholes were the epitome of luxury in a garment, I probably would never have tried them. But I guess they're still good practice for welting pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But they're particularly useful when you've got a rather large buttonhole to sew and your sewing machine won't quite make it. And then you've got a bigger piece of fabric to work with as well. (laughs) Yeah, that's such a great point. Another buttonhole that I'd like to touch on, um, but I've never sewed, it is on the to-do list at some point, is um, using a buttonhole gimp where you use a special thread, which is a wiry core, and it lifts the stitches off the surface of the cloth and gives a smooth surface for the buttonhole stitches to sit. Oh, I yeah. love that idea. Yeah. Check that out. You can have lots of fun with buttonholes, fabric loops as buttonholes, different shaped buttonholes, like triangles. Um, and again, I think we could probably do a whole episode on buttons and buttonholes. <laughs> we could, but I hope this was a helpful introduction to some of the harder items to construct on your garments as we head into fall, which brings us to our next topic. What are you going to be working on next, Tracy? (laughs) Well, I have some clear weekends and a clear sewing desk. So I'll see where it takes me. But hopefully I'm getting the last of summer with some dresses and blouses before starting to think about some autumnal wear, some coats and jackets. What a refreshing thing to have in front of you, a clean sewing desk. I never had that. (laughs) Nothing but opportunity. Um, I'm hoping that the weather breaks by the weekend because it's been so hot here and I can put the final touches on my Dior inspired jacket and hem the trouser shorts that I cut to match. And then for me, once those are done, I think I'll be ready for some trousers. Mm. Fall and autumn is hands down my favorite season. And I also recently bought a bunch of yarn on my travel. So I'm ready for sweater weather. And I have a metallic tweed trouser cut out and ready to be stitched. So that should be my next project. Uh, Waiting for the warmer weather to shift to thicker fabric season. So stay tuned for some more pants on my end. 
Oh, that sounds super. And I'm really excited to see the jacket finished. <laughs> I want to see the finished product. Dior was <laughs> so famous for that new look, soft tailored silhouette. And that actually perfectly segues into our topic for next month. Oh, I am really excited for the next episode where we'll be discussing our favorite designers to research and learn from and what unique thing they are known for being the master of. A great example would be Madame B&A and her mastering of the art of draping or Charles James and his invention of wearable sculpture through, for example, the Ida Down jacket. Um, I mean, he's got so many wonderful things. (laughs) So many things. It will be an episode chock full of fashion history and some connections to modern day designers. So whether you're looking for inspiration for your next make or you want to understand the references used on the upcoming Fashion Week runways, this will be an episode for you. But before our next episode, if you have any thoughts, comments, ideas or questions or any specific designer requests for our next episode, you can always always find us on social media at Threaded Together Podcast and on threadedtogetherpodcast.com. In the meantime, I'm Tracy. And I'm Rebecca. And this has been Threaded Together Threaded Podcast. Together Podcast. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Looking forward to our next episode in a month. Make sure you give us a thumbs up on Apple Podcast or follow us on Spotify. You can find more details on what we discussed today in the show notes below or on threadedtogetherpodcast.com. And for more behind the scenes and regular updates, you can find us on all social media channels at Threaded Together Podcast.